Today, William Nicholson's The Wind Singer. We've got two days for it. <clears throat> Hopefully you purchased it um, online the other day. We did finish Harry Potter, right? Yeah. Something like that. A um, little bit of background, not much, about Nicholson. This is his first novel for children. There are three in this um, series, The Wind Singer, The Wind on F Slaves of the Mastery, and uh, Wind on Fire is the third one, I believe. He then wrote a, a second um, trilogy for children or young adults, and I'm blanking out on the title of it. Um, he's also got some novels for adults. He really made his um, made his name as a screenwriter for t for television and film. Um, he was one of the co-writers of Gladiator, for example. Okay, Gladiator, Nell. I think it mentions on the back. Um, First Night, Shadowlands, several other things. Okay. Uh, you can get on his website, which I think is William Nicholson um, dot com, where he actually talks a little bit about how he comes up with his ideas for what he writes, and uh, and a little bit about the the philosophical kind of issues that he attempts to um, deal with them, deal with in them. If you if you read any of the blurbs, the one on the front cover, there's some on the back cover, you know, and the um, stuff on the inside, you know, it's, this novel is described as um, a vivid and passionate adventure that grips like a vice, Daily Telegraph, potent mix of thundering adventure, purposeful fantasy, The Guardian, page-turning quest adventure, crackles off the page, etc., etc., it sounds like, in other words, it's, it's just an adventure. It's a quest kind of novel, like The Lord of the Rings. It really isn't. He uses that idea of a quest, or the, the, the quest motif, merely as a technique in order to discuss some important kind of, let's say... Um, philosophical issues or relational issues, okay, which we'll look at as we, um, as we get into the book. The, um, the first chapter I want to skip over, it's, it's just kind of preface material. It's setting up where we are when we open to chapter one, or the, the long ago chapter, I should call it. It's not the first chapter, right? So we open up chapter one. And we hear baby Pin Pin makes her mark. It's Pin Pin, the two-year-old's day, to go in for her first examination. And what do we discover, not real early on, but fairly early on in the chapter, about the place in which they live, Aramanth. Describe this society. What characterizes it? Hierarchy. Hierarchy. Okay. What else? So. What goes along with hierarchy? What must there be in order for there to really be a hierarchy? <laughs> okay, that would be hierarchy. Order. I mean, look at the emphasis on order throughout this society. Right? We see the oath of dedication. Um, page 11. Everyone stands for the oath of dedication. I vow to strive harder, to reach higher, and in every way to seek to make tomorrow better than today. 
for love of my emperor and for the glory of Aramath. Now, on its face, and divorced from everything else, is there anything wrong with I vow to strive harder, to reach higher, and in every way to seek to make tomorrow better than today. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Unless you're lazy. Unless you have no ambition whatsoever. Okay? So they sit down, and we see Pinpin's examination. Notice, Pinpin is two years old. Why is a two-year-old being examined? This isn't like a medical examination, like your two-year checkup. What is the purpose of the examination? To get a base rating. Why do you need a base rating? Okay. Why else? What do base ratings say about your family? Are there any societies in the world like this? I don't mean exactly like it. I don't mean, you know, we're, that this is modeled after per se. But are there societies where how you perform really does reflect on your family? North Korea. Eastern. North Korea. South Korea, even more than North Korea. Japan. Yeah. Okay. Um... A lot of Oriental countries. United States? No, nah, not as much. We're kind of a society where, hey, everybody gets a participation trophy. Doesn't matter if, whether you win or lose. You're all wonderful kind of a mentality. So, how does Pin Pin do in her little examination? Notice what the examiner repeatedly says. Pinto half, page 13. And what a way to call you, my little fellow, Mrs. Hath says, by her name. So, Pin Pin is a girl. What does the examiner repeatedly refer to Pin Pin as? A boy. Okay. Does he have a hearing problem? No, she can hear you, but he doesn't speak. She doesn't have much to say. So he keeps questioning Pin Pin, calling him a boy, etc. And Pin Pin doesn't answer at all. Is Pin Pin stupid? Is Pin Pin retarded? Is Pin Pin autistic? No. Does Pin Pin know the answers to all of these questions? Actually, yes. So why doesn't Pin Pin answer? She doesn't want to. That's it. Okay. So, they suggest maybe if the examiner holds Pin Pin. So the examiner holds Pin Pin, and Bo and Kess kind of will Pin Pin to do something. And so the examiner says, whisk, whisk, whisk. And that is a clue to Pin Pin. Whisk, whisk, whisk. Mr. Mr. Hath tries to take her just before, but doesn't get her soon enough, and she wets all over the examiner. Because bear in mind, they have to say whether or not the child is potty trained. Okay? So, what do we discover about the Hath family in the opening chapter? Describe them according to this hierarchy and according to this understanding of order. What else also could we put up here? Part of both of this is this society is heavily regulated. Okay. Um, and tied into all of that is an emphasis on social obligation. That is, you have a duty to do well for your society. What is the Hath family? Think of all of these. They're meaningless. Okay? These are rebels, essentially. So, 
Kestrel makes a horrible friend. Next chapter. Um, Bo and Kestrel forget their homework. And they get questioned. Page 19. Dr. Batch, the teacher, asks the entire class of students, what happens if you don't work? And notice, back came the familiar response from 51 young mouths. No work, no progress. Why the response in that way? Question, response. Question, response. What does that indicate? Okay, order. What else? They've been taught this Okay, they've been taught this for a long time. It's almost like a Pavlovian response. Okay, what else? Do these children think for themselves? Not at all. And what happens if you make no progress? No progress, no points. And what happens if you get no points? No points ends up less. And keep, bear in mind, it's all 51 mouths saying this. The whole class shivered. Why? Because if you don't get any points, you end up last. And we're told, like Mumpo, the stupidest boy in the school. Some eyes turned furtively to look at him as he sat glowering and shivering right at the back in the seat of shame. Now, I don't think that necessarily means he's literally sitting on a seat named shame. It's that he is in the very back of the class. Mad Mumpo, whose upper lip was always shiny with nose dribble, dribble because he had no mother to tell him to wipe it. Smelly Mumpo, who stank so badly no one would ever go near him because he had no father to tell him to wash, so he has no parents. So he takes five points off of Bo and Kess. And what does that mean? They drop two places. They go from 25th in the class. In other words, where are they? 25th and 26th out of 51. They are exact middle. They are the median. All right? Slipping, slipping, slipping. What do we do when we find ourselves slipping down? Notice the class responds in chant-like manner. We strive harder and reach higher to make tomorrow better than today. Harder, higher, better. So, they move back. And Bo thinks, doesn't matter. We'll catch up. Kess, I don't want to. I don't care. And they go back two places. But Kess doesn't go back two places. Kess goes all the way to the back of the room next to Mumpo. And she sits down. And Mumpo speaks to her. Do you like me? Get away. You stink. Kestrel hath, go to your correct place at once. No. Whole class freezes. Why? Because that's not a correct response. Okay? Did you say no? Yes. Do you wish me to deduct five more points? Can if you want. I don't care. You don't care? Then I shall teach you to care. You'll do as you're told or, or what? I'm already at the bottom of the class. What more can you do to me? Notice, technically, she's not at the bottom of the class. She's now at 27 or 28. But she has placed herself all the way at the back, saying, I'm at the bottom of the bucket. What more can you do? How can you harm me any more than I have, she seems to be implying, harm myself? And notice, this puts the teacher in a quandary. Dr. Batch struggled with himself in silence, searching for the best way to respond. And the whole class just kind of holds its breath. Why? This has never been seen before. This is a totally new experience for them. So he has the class all turn around and look at Kestrel. Kestrel has found a new friend. So what's he going to do? He's going to humiliate her. As you see, Kestrel's new friend is our very own Mumpo. Kestrel and Mumpo side by side. What do you think of new friend Mumpo? I like Kess. He likes you, Kestrel. Why don't you sit closer? You could put your arm around him. You could hug him. He's your new friend. Who knows? Maybe in later years you'll marry each other. 
And you could be Mrs. Mumpo and have lots of little Mumpo babies. Okay. Kiss, we're not told her exact age, her and Bowman's, but she's somewhere in adolescence. Okay. And he says, then, when Kess burns with shame and anger, but maybe I've made a mistake. What's he offering her? A chance to redact. Yeah, a chance to redact what she said, an opportunity to remove herself from this position of shame and anger. Perhaps she simply sat down in the wrong seat. In other words, now's your opportunity to move back up to 27 or 28. Perhaps Kestrel is going to get up and go back to her correct place. And she doesn't move. So, he uses her position in the back of the room where she's not supposed to be as kind of the focal point of all the lessons for that morning. So they go through the verb tenses. And he uses Kestrel as an example. Kestrel loves Mumpo, present tense. Kestrel is loved by Mumpo. Kestrel, Kestrel will love Mumpo, etc., etc. And then he uses her in arithmetic. If Kestrel gives Mumpo 392 kisses and 98 hugs, and half the hugs are accompanied by kisses, and one-eighth of the hugs is a slobbery, how many slobbery kisses with hugs could Kestrel give Mumpo? On through the day. Lunch comes, Kestrel gets up, and Mumpo's sticking by her side. Get lost, Mumpo. Where are you going, Kess? Out. I hate school. Bowman, uh, yeah, but Kess, come on. I mean, everyone hates school, but you had to go. What about the family rating? I, I don't know. Kess, uh, Bumpo, don't cry, Kess. I'll be your friend. Go Get lost, Mumpo. Page 24. Bowman, Kess, top of 25, come back to school. Sit in your proper place and Batch will leave you alone. I'm never going back. Okay, if she never goes back, then what does she do to what society is built upon? She destroys it. She says, to hell with your hierarchy, to hell with your order, to hell with your regulations, and to hell with your obligations. How is Kestrel acting? Rebellious. Rebellion comes from what? A sense of what? Okay. Society, Aramanth wants you to think of the good of society. Okay. What is Kestrel thinking of? Good of herself. In other words, she's acting as an, as an individual. Something we don't see in this society. Okay. So notice the tension Nicholson places between the individual versus society, or the role of the individual within society. Okay? So, Kestrel says, I'm not going back. You must. I'm going to tell Pa. He'll understand. Mumpo, and I will. Go away, Mumpo. Go away or I'll bash you. She raises a fist. Mumpo drops whimpering to his knees. Hurt me if you want. I don't mind. She stared at Mumpo. Bum Bowman, too, was watching Mumpo. He was caught unawares by the feeling of what it was like to be Mumpo. A dull, cold terror rolled over him and a penetrating loneliness. He almost cried out loud, so intense was the hunger for kindness. Now, we've not been told exactly yet but Bowman has a gift. He can feel what other people are feeling. He doesn't have to touch you. It's not like a Spockian mind meld or anything. He can just kind of reach out with his soul and experience what your soul is experiencing. And notice what happens here. What is Mumpo to all the other children? Undesirable. Undesirable? What else? Nobody. What do we call usually undesirable nobodies? 
loser. It's exactly right. Okay. And what does Bo do? He experiences what Mumpo experiences. Look at the passage again. He's caught unawares. That is, he's not ready for this. It just suddenly washes over him of what it was like to be Mumpo. That is, he experiences what somebody else experiences. A dull, cold terror rolled over him. This is what it's like to be Mumpo and a penetrating loneliness. Why is Mumpo lonely? He doesn't have any parents and no one in class that talks to him. He has no parents and no friends. He doesn't mean that she won't hit you. She can if she wants. Why does Mumpo say Kes can hit me if she wants? Okay, there's some interaction there. At least she will have used the old AT&T commercial, reached out and touched him. Does anybody touch him? No. If she reaches out in anger and strikes him, what does that at least, and this is weird and twisted, okay? This is the way battered women think. What does it at least show? Exactly. There is a connection between them. His face gazed adoringly up at her, his eyes now as shiny as his upper lip. His upper lip shiny because his nose is running. Why are his eyes shiny? Tears. Tell him you won't hit him, Kiss. I won't hit you, she says. You're too stinky to touch. How's that for compassion? How's that for reaching out and showing empathy for somebody? Okay. She keeps walking down the street, Bowman following beside her and Mumpo behind her. And she and Bowman talk to each other in their heads because they're telepaths. I can't go on like this. What else can we do? I don't know. Something, something. And then we get bad words said out loud. Chapter 3. Okay. We find out how Aramanth is shaped, configured. It's a city shaped in a circle, enclosed by high walls, okay? And it's got sectors, kind of rings, concentric rings, okay? Outside the city, there's nothing but a desert. There's a seashore to the south, there's mountains far to the north, okay? But within the walls, page 27, there was all that was necessary for life, more for a good life. I think that Nicholson here is alluding to a quote, a famous quote by a famous 18th century British writer named Samuel Johnson, who said, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life, for there is in London all that life can afford. That is, Everything you need for life is in London. You don't need to go anywhere else. All right? Every citizen of Aramanth knew how fortunate they were. Why? To live in this rare haven of, notice the three things Aramanth has, peace, plenty, and equal opportunity for all. Equal opportunity for all. What does that mean? I mean, that is supposedly a hallmark of the United States. I mean, part of the American dream. You can rise from nothing to be president. You can rise from nothing to become extremely filthy rich. Right? Equal opportunity for all. What kind of opportunity is there for Mumpo? Well, doesn't he just need to strive harder to do better, to make tomorrow better than today? If he did that, wouldn't he rise up? Cities arranged in districts, in concentric rings, okay? 
outermost ring is gray district, then maroon district, then orange district, then scarlet district, and then white district. Okay. What do the, each of the colors correspond to or each of the colors indicate? Do you want to live in white or do you want to live in gray? You want to live in white. Why? Big houses. Lots of freedom. And I don't mean freedom, political freedom. I mean freedom to move. Where bedrooms are the size of this room rather than the size of this table. And I mean this table. Okay. When the halves have to move from orange down to gray, they move from a house with two bedrooms and bath and kitchen and a living area, which is separate than the living area, to what? A one-room apartment. It's not a one-bedroom apartment. It's one room, which we're told is barely big enough to hold Ira and Hannah hath bed. Okay? So a room maybe the size of these three tables, which includes bedroom, eating area, okay, and everything else. And how many people? Five. Okay. We get the description of the wind singer. And we're told at the bottom of 29, Kestrel had loved the wind singer all her life. She loved it because it was unpredictable and served no purpose and seemed by its sad cry not to like the orderly world of Aramanth. Okay, notice it's unpredictable. Is there unpredictability in Aramanth? No, everything is predictable. It serves no purpose. Does anything not have purpose in Aramanth? No, everything has purpose. Everything you do has purpose. Related to what? Family rating. Okay. So sometimes we're told when the frustrations of our existence grew too hard to bear, what would she do? She'd run down the nine tiers of the arena and she'd go and she'd talk to the wind singer. Did it talk back? Nope. Though if the wind blew, you would hear kind of the howling through those funnels. On this day, the worst so far, this is page 30, Kestrel headed instinctively for the arena. Her father would not be home from the library yet. Her mother would not be at the clinic. Her mother would be at the clinic. So where else was there to go? Later, she was accused of plotting her disgraceful actions in advance, but she wasn't a schemer. That is, she didn't think that way. In other words, how does she behave? Rashly, impetuously, on the fly. She acted on impulse. Mumpo followed her. Why? Because he loved her. So... Page 32. Kestrel came to a stop at last at the foot of the wind singer. Her rage at Pinpin's test and Dr. Batch's taunts and the whole suffocating order of Aramanth had formed within her a wild desire to upset, to confuse, to shock. Just to fracture the smooth and seamless running of the world, if only for a moment. She'd come to the wind singer because it was her friend and ally, and she starts to climb. And Bowman's like, um, don't do that. She keeps climbing. She gets up there. One of the marshals comes down. Mumpo's just sitting there because he loves Kess, and he's hungry. He hasn't had lunch. They skipped lunch. Page 33. But now Kestrel had reached the wind singer's neck and was making an interesting discovery. There's a slot cut into the broad metal pipe and an arrow etched above it and a design above the arrow that looks like an S. It's this image. All right? So the scarlet-robed official says, what's she doing? Who are you? 
Bo says, I'm her sister, I'm her brother. Okay. He yells at Kestrel to get down and she swears at him. Pongo. What? What did she say? Pongo. She said Pongo to me. Bowman. I'm not sure. She might have been saying it to me. Maybe she thinks it's your name. Okay. And he yells to her again. And then what does she start to do? Page 35. Bang a plop. Sag a hawk. Pump a pump a pump a pump a rune. All these things that in the language of Aramanth are cuss words. And then one of the college examiners comes out and she says, I hate school. I hate ratings. Top of 36. And the examiners hear this in shock. Why? Because no one does, does this and the whole system is based on ratings. Is this totally foreign from our life? Think about it. No, it's not. Every one of you has a rating. Your GPA. How important is that rating? Especially when you graduate and go look for a job. Or maybe some of you plan on going on to graduate school. It's much more important if you're planning on going on to graduate school than it is if you're going on to get a job. All your employers essentially think about is, do you have the sheet of paper that says I are an MTSU graduate? Okay. 90% of them aren't going to give a rat's you-know-what for your GPA, or really even your major, unless it's a narrow major, a specific major, like recording industry management or an accountant. Okay. I won't strive harder. I won't reach higher. I won't make tomorrow better than today. She is uttering, essentially, blasphemy for this society. More and more people come down. So now she's got a what? She's got an audience. She's got a crowd. I don't love my emperor. There's no glory in Aramanth. So she is completely undercutting everything the society stands for. Now, could you go to the Washington Monument and stand there at the base of the Washington Monument and say... I hate the First Amendment, I hate the Second Amendment, I, you know, and go through all 28 amendments or 27 amendments to the Constitution? Yes, you could. And what would happen? Get some glares. You might get some glares. you probably get a long bunch of people going, yeah, I don't like that amendment either. We should get rid of it, you know. And she keeps yelling this stuff, Pongo to exam. I won't strive hard, as she keeps saying. Page 37. The school teacher was right. Kestrel had become a wild thing. Meaning, all of the civilizing behavior of Aramath is gone. The wildness coursed through her, glorious and liberating. As she swung from side to side on the top of the windsinger, shouted all the terrible, unthinkable thoughts that had been buried within her for so long, now, there's an interesting idea. Unthinkable thoughts. Thoughts that are not allowed to be thought. Do we have any of those in our society? What's an example of an unthinkable thought? What's an example of a thought that will get you in trouble? If you express it. Murder is not a thought. Murder is an action. I mean a thought. An idea. An idea that you believe. Or maybe you don't even believe it. Maybe you just want to discuss it. An idea that if you publicly expressed it. Might. Get you fired from your job. Might get you. Expelled from a university, 
were put, in, put on suspension from a university. Or get you in trouble with the police. Or get you in trouble with the government. We have a whole mess of those kinds of thoughts. Or ideas. Name one. Okay, too broad. Be very specific. What is a thought? Let's say you're a weatherman or weather woman. What is a thought you're not allowed to have? As a weather forecaster, as a meteorologist. I'm going to give you an example, but I want you to try to come up with it first. Because this happened to a very famous weathercaster, a meteorologist, who worked for the national station in France. One station, <laughs> the national TV station. He was a very, very famous meteorologist. He was fired the other day because of an idea that he holds. Any guesses? What did Al Gore do a movie about that won him a freaking Oscar? Global warming. An inconvenient truth. Anthropogenic global warming. That is, climate change caused by us. Not cyclical. Okay? This French TV weatherman said anthropogenic global warming one is not real and two is a scientific fraud okay this guy is a scientist he's not just a pretty face okay he's a meteorologist he studies this he says it's a scientific fraud why well, partly is because it's designed to earn or generate research dollars. If you argue for anthropogenic global warming, it is very easy to get all kinds of money from your government. Whatever your government is, whether it's the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France's, etc. Okay? So why was he fired? Because this is an idea that is unthinkable. Why? Because Al Gore, Obama, Clinton, etc. say the science is what? Settled. The consensus is that there is anthropogenic global warming. Okay? The French scientists perspective, and a lot of others. I mean, he's not alone by that. Not alone in this. The guy who actually founded the Weather Channel, meteorologist, was totally against anthropogenic global warming. Okay? Um, anyways, Clinton, Gore, um, Obama, etc. say, the consensus is, there is. But since when has science ever been quote unquote ruled by consensus. Never. What was the consensus back in 1610 when Galileo looked through a telescope and proved Copernicus and Kepler were correct that everything, everything didn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolved around the sun which itself moved in space. Okay. Consensus is a, is a nothing when it comes to science. Okay? So, she has an unthinkable thought. What does that mean? Well, as with this French scientist, and we could talk about other unthinkable thoughts. Okay? Thoughts that if you hold them can get you in trouble. Especially if you argue vociferously for them. Okay. 
thoughts related to politics, thoughts related to the Constitution, thoughts related to religion, etc. So what happens if you think unthinkable thoughts? You have to be silenced. You have to be shut down. If you're interested in all in this, and you should be, because the world you're inheriting is a lot different than the world I inherited, and you're going to see less and less freedom of thought, you ought to read a book called The Silencing, okay, by Kirsten Powers. I think I've made it clear before. I'm pretty far right wing. I'm a staunch conservative. Kirsten Powers is liberal. She's a lefty. Okay? And she's saying, as a lefty, who generally like to shut down freedom of debate and thought, okay? she's saying, this is dangerous. Because what does it mean? It means we can't debate ideas. It's only through free, free and open debate that we arrive at the truth. What kind of truth do they have? In Aramanth. What kind of debate do they have? None. The truth is what? Whatever is determined by whoever is at the top. Whatever the government says. Okay. Like North Korea. Like Cuba. Like, again, Russia. You know, there's a, a little window of real freedom in Russia. Beginning about 1989, it lasted till about 2002, when Putin got elected president, and Putin shutting it down again. So, back to page 37. Um, and shouted all the terrible, unthinkable thoughts that had been buried within her for so long. She had gone so far now, she had broken so many rules, said such wicked things, she knew she would suffer the most severe punishment. And since what was done could not be undone, she was free to be as bad as she wanted to be. In other words, I'm going to suffer. I may as well just go whole hog. So that when I suffer, I suffer for really having busted everything. Pongo to the emperor. What's that? F Obama. That's what that is. Okay. Where is he anyways? I've never seen him. There isn't any emperor. So maybe it's not F. Obama, maybe it's F. God. Where is he? I haven't seen him. Notice her logic. Because I haven't seen him, he must not exist. Okay. The chief examiner comes in. Page 38. Mumpo looks up at him. Please, sir, do you have any food? Like he's channeling Oliver Twist. The chief examiner looks down and saw Mumpo, his nose dribbling, his face grimy, his moist, stupid eyes gazing up at him, and he snatched his robe away in sudden fury. Don't you touch me, you poxy little brat. Poxy means like he's sick. Mumpo was used to being brushed off or laughed at, but the pure hatred he heard in the chief examiner's voice astounded him. I only wanted... And the chief examiner strides on. Okay? Mumpo, page 39. I don't want to be an Aramant, says Mumpo, in response to one of the marshals telling him, we don't want your sort in Aramant. Why don't they want people like Mumpo in Aramant? Louder. Because he's at the bottom. Why else? I've never been, but I've heard this, even though I lived in Orlando for two years. I've heard that Disney is perfect. That is, you walk around Disney, and how much trash do you see? You're not supposed to see any. Because they're supposed to be, you know, cleaning it up all the time. Okay? It's supposed to be kind of this pristine world. Why do police pull over people who are walking, especially, let's say, people of the, oh, let's say, wrong skin complexion? 
wrong skin color, who are walking on a sidewalk in a gated community. Brentwood, Bell Mead. You see some black guy in a hoodie and he gets pulled over. Why? Not their idea of Keep going. Okay. He doesn't fit in with this notion of who belongs in this community. Doesn't belong because who, obviously, in this notion, does belong in this community? Wealthy white people. Okay. So why does he say we don't want your type in Aramant? We want our country, we want our city, Aramant, to be what? Perfect. What does Mampo remind them of? Imperfection. Okay. You know. Um... Russia, before the Winter Olympics last time, they went throughout Sochi, which is where the Winter Olympics were held, and did what? We're going to see the same thing happen with Brazil in the upcoming Summer Olympics. We're just going to see the same thing happen in Qatar when they hold the World Cup in, in 2022 or 2018, whatever year it is. What do these countries do okay, to the dispossessed, the poor? The homeless. Kick them out. Round them up and get rid of them. Why? Because that's not who we are. We don't have homeless. It's like Iran saying, there are no homosexuals in Iran. Really? Well, I mean, once they get hold of them, there aren't. <laughs> because they execute them. So he says, we don't want you to sort an Mumpo, I don't want to be an Aramant, but I don't know where else to go. Okay. Bottom of page 40. I mean, Kestrel's just letting, you know, one four-letter word or seven-letter word after another go. Maslow Inch gazed up at her for a few moments as if to familiarize himself with her face. He said nothing more. The girl had mocked and insulted everything that Aramanth most respected. She would be punished, of course, but her, the case called for more than punishment. She must be broken. That is, punishment's not enough. He's not a man to shrink from hard decisions. Young as she was, it must be done. It must be done once and for all. So how do you break... So he doesn't mean kill. So what does it mean? She must be broken. Yeah, that wild, indomitable spirit, like a stallion, must be what? Broken and reined in. She's got to have the proverbial bit put between her jaws. Why? To control her. Okay? So, they send her home. Page 42. Kestrel climbs down, goes to her father, and Bo sits there, thinks beside them, Pa can't help us. In other words, oh boy, did you screw up. He wants to, he can't. Pa can't help us. And Kestrel thinks back, I know, but he does love us. That is, it's like, they're suddenly a little bit distinct from their parents, okay? And they walk on home, and Kestrel says, it's going to be bad for us, isn't it? And Hanno says, yep. We're going to have to move to Maroon District, which is down from Orange. And he says, probably. No, they're going past Maroon, okay? And that evening, they make their family wish huddle, page 44. They get in a circle, okay? Hanno Hath kneels down on the floor, reached up his arms. Bowman under one, Kestrel under the other. Pin Pin stood with her face pressed to his chest, so she's kind of in the middle. Ira Hath kneels behind Pin Pin, wraps her arms over the other two children, and reaches around to her husband. So you've got Pin Pin in the middle, 
Hannah like this, Ira like this, and the two older children on the outside. And what does their wish huddle do? They lean their heads inwards till they're touching. So all the heads are touching. And they say their night wished. Night wish. Kestrel. I wish there were no more exams. Ever. Bowman. I wish nothing bad happens to Kess. Ira. I wish my darling children to be safe and happy forever. The father. I wish the wind singer would sing again. Who's got the most ludicrous seeming wish? Father or Kess? I wish for there to be no exams ever. What are exams to this society? Their air. This society lives on exams. What about ours? Think about it for a moment. Children start taking national exams. Nationally mandated exams. I don't know that it's kinder. Is it kindergarten? I know it's first grade. You do have to take exams to get into kindergarten. Think about that for a moment. Five years old, you've got to take an exam to determine whether or not you are ready for kindergarten. Yeah, take one to get into pre-K too. Some pre-K kindergarten. What is kindergarten su supposed to be? Okay, I'm 53. I remember what kindergarten was like when I was five. First of all, it was half day. <laughs> okay. And it wasn't the case where you had to know your letters before you started kindergarten. And it wasn't the case where you had to know your letters when you finished kindergarten. Kindergarten was all about putting kids in a classroom together for four hours of the day to get them used to that kind of setting. That's it. It was largely playtime and color time and story time and was pretty much it. Yeah, we did start to learn letters and things like that, but it wasn't like it is today, okay? So we now start having these real tests, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, all the way up through senior, okay? What are the tests designed to do? Are they designed to measure your aptitude? Are they designed to measure what you've learned. No. What are they designed to do? Louder? Give you a rating. Okay. Yes and no. What, who are they really designed to give a rating to? The school. Because how the school does determines what? Funding. The funding. How the school district does determines how much funding it will get from the state. How the state does as a whole will determine how much federal funding it receives. So teachers start to do what? Beginning in first grade. They teach to the test. So that you hear Six and seven year olds start talking in September about practice tests. Getting ready for the big test that will come in April. Rather than learning for learning's sake. Okay? There is no here learning for learning's sake. What do they learn? What kind of learning? Do they experience here? Sheer memorization. And I don't, there's nothing wrong with memorization. Frankly, our schools would do a lot better if they'd come back to doing more sheer memorization. Okay? But they don't even do that. 
So, Hanno says it's only an old story. Nobody believes it anymore. Talking about the wincing. Kestrel, I do. Her brother, you can't. You don't know more about it than anybody else. In other words, how do you believe in it when you don't know what the wind singer is for? How do you believe in it when you don't know anything more about it than anybody else does? Kestrel, I believe it because nobody else believes it. Step of faith? Her father smiles. And he tells the story. The happiness of the people of Aramantha angered the spirit lord called the Mora, Bowman, but the Mora is not real. His father, no, nobody believes in the Mora anymore. Does his father say it's not real? Nope. He just says nobody believes in it. Because nobody believes in it, does that make it not real? Kestrel, I do. The Mora was angry, went the old story, sent a terrible army, the army of the Tsars, to destroy Aramath. Then the people were afraid and took the voice out of the Windsinger and gave it to the Mora. The Mora accepted the offering and the Tsars turned back without destroying Aramath. And the Windsinger never sang again. And she says, it's true. I found the place where the Windsinger goes, where the voice goes. Hanno, so have I. What does that mean? He too has climbed the tower and found the slot. So she says, the story must be true. Hanno, who knows? Ira, maybe they'll forget about it. Maybe they'll forget about Kess swearing at the top of her lungs for hours. Mm, not likely. Okay. And Ira Half, page 47, says in her Prophetess voice, oh, unhappy people, tomorrow comes the sorrow. And we get a warning from the chief examiner. Okay. Page 49. Kess is taken to the chief examiner along with Hanno Hath. And he tells Kestrel, your father and I were in school together. We played together. Remember Hanno? He says, yes, I remember. He remembered how Hanno, how Maslow Inch had been so much bigger than the rest of them, had made them kneel before him. But he said nothing about that. He just wanted to get it over with as quickly as possible. So, page 50. Hanno looks at the smooth face of the chief examiner and sees in his eyes a deep well of hatred. And he's thinking, why? Why does this guy fear me? Who is Hanno Half compared to the chief examiner? Nobody. Loser. Okay. So, he takes them where? Under the city, to the old salt mines. Page 52. Um, Kestrel has just said, when he asked the question, you said to your class teacher, what more can you do to me? Kestrel says, what if I did? Top of 52. Well, you know, of course, that your own rating affects your family rating. What if it does? Notice the tone in her voice. What if I did? What if it does? In other words, so what? Well, that's what we're about to find out. What more can you do to me? Maslow Inch says. An interesting question, but the wrong one. You should ask, what more can I do to myself and to those I love. In other words, you're not going to be the one to suffer. It'll be your family that suffers. So he says, I'm taking to see the salt caves. They go on down. He leads them to a long railing. Kestrel kind of goes out on it. And they see down beneath them 
the sludge from the sewers of the city. Top of 54. He says to her, You think, young lady, that if you do as you please and make no effort at school, you and your family will go down from orange to maroon. You think you don't mind that. Perhaps you'll go down again from maroon to gray. You think you don't mind that either. Gray district isn't pretty or comfortable, but it's the bottom, and at least they'll leave you alone there. That's what you think, isn't it? The worst that can happen is we'll go all the way down to gray. Kestrel, no, even though that's exactly what she thinks. You think it could be worse? She doesn't say anything. You're quite right. It could be far, far worse. After all, gray district, poor as it is, is still part of Aramath. But there is a world below Aramath. And she sees the murky surface of the lake. You're looking at the under lake, a lake of decomposing matter that's bigger than all Aramath. There are islands in the lake, islands of mud. Do you see? And far away she sees. And then she sees a little figure move over an island of mud. Hannah, do people live down here? They do. Many thousands. Men, women, children. Primitive, degraded people. A little better than animals. They live on what we throw away. They live in rubbish and they live on rubbish. You ask, what more can, we do, can you do to me? Here's your answer. Why do we strive harder? Why do we reach higher? Because we don't want to live like this. And Kestrel shrugs. I don't care. You don't care? No. I don't believe you. Then don't. Prove you don't care. He opens a gate in the railing. He says, go on. Walk on out to the end if you don't care. What's he just done? He's challenged her. This is a dare. What kind of person is Kestrel? If you dare me, I'm going to step up to it. She goes out. Her father says, that's enough. Okay, Maslow, you made your point. Leave her to me. We've left your children to you for too long, Hanno. What does that mean? Okay. Who do the children belong to? Do children belong to their parents or to the state? Children follow the example given by their parents. There's something broken inside you, my friend. There's no fight in you anymore. No will to succeed. Kestrel hears this, and she keeps on walking. Her father calls out to her. Okay. Maslow grips his arm and says, she has to learn. And he pulls a lever, and the bridge-like thing that she's on does this. And she starts to slide. Page 57, slipping, slipping, slipping. Well, Kestrel, do you care now? Papa, help me. Do you care now? Will you try harder? Tell me. I want to hear. She keeps crying for her father. Hanno strikes Maslow Inch. Don't you dare touch me, you worm. Page 58. You dribble, you maggot, you failure. You fail your exams, you fail your family, you fail your country. What use are you? You're a nothing. You do nothing. You make no effort. You make others. You expect others to do it all for you. All you do is read your useless books. You're a parasite. You're a germ. Why? All you do is read your useless books. What does Hanno um, Hath produce for society? Nothing. Nothing. He's not, let's use the language of the United States, a productive member of society. All he does is read his useless books and catalog them at the library. Okay? So, Kestrel comes back up. She hugs Maslow. She jumps on his back. Covered in mud, he's dressed in his whites, his white robes. And Maslow says to Hanno, page 59 at the bottom, Well, old friend, what do you say to that? You shouldn't have done that to her. Is that all? 
Hannah Hath was silent. He would not apologize for his daughter's behavior, but nor was it wise to say what he really felt, which that he was intensely proud of her. Why is Hannah proud of his daughter? What has she done? Stood up to him. Why? What is she doing in standing up to Maslow Inch? Who is she defending? Who is she protecting? Who do you earn ratings for? Okay. Your family. What's more important? Standing up and defending your family or earning your damn little ratings? Maslow. I, I see the problem isn't with the daughter. He says, I see we have a far more serious problem with the girl than I had realized. So, she's going to go off to special teaching. Okay? And she runs out of the special teaching, and she goes upstairs and meets, Chapter 7, The Emperor. Page 71, he's sitting there eating these little chocolate things. And she says, why do we have walls? Why indeed? Why do we have to have districts in different colors? Why do we have examinations and ratings? Why do we have to strive harder, reach harder, make tomorrow better than today? And she's like, oh my God, I can't believe this. This is an adult saying this. And he explains that he's the emperor. What did she say earlier? I don't believe in the emperor. I've never seen him. He's not real. Well, he is real. Okay. So, he tells her, page 73, she has to go to the halls of the Mora and fetch the voice back for the wind singer. And he pulls out the sheet of paper and explains it to her. And she says to herself, page 75, it's real. It's real. Okay? What will happen when the wind singer sings again? We'll be free of the Mora. She's like, what do you mean free of the Mora? The Mora is just a story. Pfft, just a story. The emperor was just a story. And now she's met him. Beard of my ancestors. Just a story. Page 75. The city worse than a prison? The people scratching their lives away in envy and hatred? You say it's just a story? How are the people scratching their lives away in envy and hatred? What happens when little Pin Pin screws up in her examination? What do some of the other families immediately think? Oh, they're going to go down. Which means we go up. <laughs> okay. Why are people glad when the Hath family gets removed from Orange Sector? Because somebody from gray or maroon sector will get to move up. So is this a society where everybody is equal? Where everybody is happy? No, it's a society based on the idea of possession, of materialism. And you get what you want only by somebody else losing what they want. It's not a society... And I don't care what your politics or what your economic belief is. It's not a society in what I'm going to call good capitalism, where the pie gets ever larger. It's a society that says, no, the pie is one fixed size. And in order for you to get more of the pie, what must somebody else get? Less. 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 Okay. So, he tells her that the more rules am Araman. She says, no, nobody, nobody knows that. They all think the more is a story from long ago. Do they? She says, all I know is I hate school, I hate tests, I hate examiners, I hate Aramath. Well, of course you do. That's all the work of the Mora. They call Aramath the perfect society. Have they done away with fear and hatred? Of course not. Okay. So, she asked, page 77, does the Winsinger have the power to stop the Mora? He says, I don't know. My grandfather said there must be a power in the voice. So, she asked him, why doesn't he go? 
And why doesn't he? Page 80. Uh, take that back. Um, he says there's a difficulty. Page 79. I think of going, he says, I like the look of that door. I might set off just one more chocolate button. Just one more chocolate candy. What's the chocolate candy? What does the chocolate candy represent for him? The people in the city of Aramath don't have the chocolate candy. They have their own form of what the chocolate candy represents. It's slavery to Aramath. She says, take the ball, take the bowl with you. He says, I can't, because it'll get empty. Why do you like chocolate buttons so much? Page 80. I don't know that I like them particularly. They just seem necessary. Okay. So, Kess leaves. We see the half family shamed. Dr. Batch comes to ask questions. And Kess, Kess shows up, shows her father the map. Her father can read Old Manth. Okay? And he tells her what the inscriptions in Old Manth say along it, and she writes it down. Um, chapter 9. Kess and Bowman are getting ready to leave. Bowman sees Mumpo outside. He takes Kess's orange clothing to Mumpo, puts him in it so that Mumpo can be a diversion. Okay. As the family is being moved down to the Gray District. Um... They make their way down into the salt mines, and they run into the old children, and then fall into the water. And let's keep going. Um, page, chapter 10, 106 and 107. Let's see here. Pick up with 107. Kess looked across the watery mud, and as she did so, a half-familiar form rose up, spluttering and grunting. It's Mumpo. Hello, Kess. It was you. I saw you go down the hole. Followed you. I'm your friend. Mumpo, you saved me. Mumpo saved her from the old children, those weird beings that if they touch you, you suddenly age like they are. They were going to hurt you. I won't let anyone hurt you, Kess. She gazed at him, covered from head to toe in mud, marveled that he could look so pleased with himself. She says, Mumpo, you were brave and strong, and I'll always thank you for saving me. But you must go back. Why does she want Mumpo to go back? Because he's Mumpo. She doesn't want him following her. Okay? So they go on. And they meet the mud people, Wulam. And the next day they do their harvest. And they get taken off to meet the old queen. Pages 118, 119. Um... Actually, I'm going to skip that part. Pick up with... Page 129 and 130. They tell Jum that they're going to the halls of the Mora. She kind of shudders and says, we don't talk about that here. Page 130. There's none of that here. We don't want any, neither. There's enough of that up yonder. What's the that she's talking about? The Mora. Think of the 
difference between the world under more uh, the world under Aramanth and the world of Aramanth. What do they have under Aramanth that they don't have above or in Aramanth? Okay. Louder. Freedom. Freedom. They can do as they please in the underworld. Okay? She looks up yonder and says, In Aramanth? Jung, up yonder. Live the people of the one we don't name. That is, the people of the Mora. But you know that, little skinny. That's why you're running away. Kestrel, no. But Bo shuts her off. Yes, we do know that. Though he hardly knew how to explain what it was he had just realized. Indistinctly, he was sensing that the world he knew so well, the only world he had ever known until now, was a sort of prison. And that its people, his people, were trapped within its high walls. And so what does Bo start to feel for the people of Aramanth? Pity. Empathy. What do they not know? That they are prisoners. Up yonder is the world of the one we don't name, says Jum again. One way or the other, they all belong to one. Bowman, but when the wind singer sings again, we won't belong to the one you don't name. Ah, the wind singer is it. They am be, be stories, old stories. I should like to hear that, wind singer. Okay. So, Jump says you need to go speak to the old queen. And they see Mumpo. Mumpo has been taking part in the mud nut harvest. And what do they see him do? They, say, they see him climb up this tall ladder and kind of cliff dive into the mud. Bottom of 132. That's Mumpo. Top of 133. And so it was. He looked thin and fragile alongside the others, but he was the most daring of them all. He swung himself about on top of the pole, swooped and sprang back again. And when he dived, he flung himself farther than any of them and stayed beneath the mud longer than any of them. What are we learning about Mumpo? Is he useless? Is he stupid? He's already saved Kess's life. And now what's he showing us? Is this, by the way, only because of the ticks of leaves, essentially the pot that he's on? No. That's what gives him the inhibition, okay, to make the jump. But we discover he's a natural athlete, all right? So they go off, and we're told by Bowman, 134. But Bowman was reflecting on the image of Mumpo diving from the top of the high pole. His body had been so surprisingly graceful, it gave him a different sense of Mumpo altogether. He was like a wild goose, ungainly on the ground, but beautiful in sight. Excuse me, in flight. Bowman liked this thought, but there was no pity in it. It struck him now that the pity he felt for Mumpo was a form of indifference. Why had he not been more curious about him? After all, Mumpo was in his own way a mystery. Where did he come from? Why did he have no family? Everybody in Aramanth had a family. Why is Mumpo the only one without a family? We find out at the end of the novel. Okay, so they go and speak to the old queen. In one forty one forty one, Bowman kind of reaches into her heart. He felt her top of one forty one. He felt her angry mutterings and faraway regrets, and beneath it all, a dull, bone-aching weariness. Why the bone-aching weariness? She's old. She's ready to die. And then, waiting patiently, reaching deeper and deeper, he came upon a region of fear that was dark and silent as night. And there, suddenly, he felt it. A hole in emptiness and nothingness that opened into terror. She's going to die. That's the openness. That's the emptiness. She's afraid of death. Too tired to live. Too afraid to die. And she says, how did you creep into my heart? But for the moment, the two of them were joined. 
The old queen raised her thin, trembling arms, and knowing what she bo wanted, Bowman climbed onto her chair and let her hold him, fold him in a fragile embrace. So, she tells him about the czars. And she tells him how they need to get out. And we're going to pick up on Thursday with chapter 13, I think. Hold on, let me just double check. Uh, yeah, we'll pick up with chapter 13 on Thursday, kind of in the middle of the chapter.